Just wonder, maybe. You know, or thunder too, yeah, that could work as well. <laughs> Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. <laughs> Sings of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some harmonious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fault of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I constrain to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to one favorite verse is verse number three because it talks about uh you know find it real heal here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it to um seal it for thy courts above but my favorite part of that verse is when it says if i can find it where it says fetters <clears throat> fetter bind my wandering fetter i didn't know what, what it meant but um i looked it up not that long ago and fetter means chains so shackle ourselves so fetter um, like goodness, like a fetter, bind, so shackle my, me and bind my wandering heart to thee. And I just love that verse because that's what we must do for our Savior is we must fetter, shackle ourselves to him and uh, to serve him the right way. All right, Brother Caleb, would you pray for us? Yes, sir. God, thank you for this wonderful day, Lord. Uh, please bless your service, Lord. Um, please help us to sing well, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. All right. We'll have uh, pass. Uh, you were gonna stay with yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Everyone can be All seated. Right. Maybe seated, everybody. All right. So I think we'll. Uh, I won't take up long, but I'm glad we have a good turnout this morning for Sunday school. We're missing some regulars, but maybe they'll roll in eventually. Maybe they won't make it. I know it's been a full week, uh, but uh, I'm excited about what we've done thus far. And I don't want to take up any of Brother Jeff's time, so Brother Jeff, you go ahead and come on up. We are looking forward to what you have for us this morning. Thank you. It's good to see you this morning. Turn with me in God's Word to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Thanks for singing my favorite hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You know what and that became my favorite hymn? I say. On the Baptist History Board right. that you did here in Maine. Yes. All those men in those old buildings, it just... That's very good. Yeah, it was a blessing. And there is a fourth verse oh, uh, to that song that's not in most modern hymnals. Huh. And it's, I'll go ahead and tell you a song. It was a story <laughs> about the song. It's written by Robert Robinson. He was um, Baptist in England, converted under the ministry of George Whitfield, for a time was a Church of England preacher until at a service where an infant was to be baptized. He realized there was a problem with what the Church of England believed about baptism because the preacher who was supposed to administer 
that sacrament, as they call it, did not show up for the service. The mother of that sickly infant thought that the infant would die and go to hell without having received uh, water in baptism. Mm -hmm. So he examined the scriptures. He realized then that baptism is for believers only and it's by immersion. Amen. So he broke with the Church of England, became a Baptist. George Whitfield broke fellowship with him, but Robinson uh, pastored in Cambridge, the Andrew Street Baptist Church there. It is still in existence, an active congregation. He pastored it for 26 years until the day of his death. There is a popular story that says Robinson got away from the Lord and uh, some years later was in a coach and a young lady started singing that song and he, as the story goes, looked like he was condemned. And she said, don't you know the song? He said, yes, I'm the miserable wretch who wrote that many years ago, and I'd give a thousand worlds if I could feel now as I felt then. It sounds like a good story. It's told over and over in books and on the Internet and everything, but there's one great problem with it. It wasn't true. He never got away from the Lord, and he remained a faithful pastor there at the church till the day of his death, preached two times the day before he died. So uh, people can really come up with some things and uh, sounds good and they'll pass it on. But we're talking about the Bible this week. So this morning, let's talk about the preservation of the scriptures. We know that God gave them and it's his work to preserve them. And in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 14, here's something about God, and this is my favorite verse of the Bible, personally. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 14. Lord, thank you for your word. <clears throat> it is good to be with the saints at the meeting house. We ask your blessing now on our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the preservation of the scriptures. Now, we've looked this week, or last week, I guess now, <laughs> we looked at how God gave the scriptures, the languages in which he gave them, and uh, the languages in which they were translated, and uh, how he brought our Bible into being. And so, as far as the scriptures as a whole this morning... We we want to look at how God preserved them, not necessarily the means, but the fact that he preserved them uh, to be a certain way. In other words, uh, his, he has preserved the scriptures with his own attributes. What is true of God is true of the word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, they are eternal, for he is eternal. You know what the Bible says over in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27 concerning God. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. So the eternal God, he is our refuge. We have referenced this passage of scripture several times in this meeting, but the book of Isaiah Isaiah 40 and verse 8. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And uh, it is eternal. And uh, what is eternal? Well, eternal is as far back as you can go in the past and as far forward as you can go in the present. Mm -hmm. uh, that's everything. Uh, it exceeds time on both ends. That's eternal. Now, everlasting is from this point forward, from now on. When you get saved, you not only get everlasting life, you get eternal life mm -hmm. because you get Jesus, mm -hmm. and he is that eternal life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book has always existed. We know that because the scripture teaches us so. So uh, the word is eternal for he is eternal. The words of the Lord are alive for he is alive. 
and we go to Jeremiah 10, 10th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. The scripture here says he is the living God. John chapter 6 tells us about his words. John chapter 6, as the Lord is teaching, and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, this is a living book. Why? Because its author is a living God. And this book will be alive as long as he is alive. So we have uh, no worries that the word of God will ever perish. The Bible tells us also, in fact, one of the greatest scriptures in Hebrews uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse 12, one of the greatest scriptures concerning the word of God, for the word of God is quick. Now that word means living. Right. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now there's the word personified in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So verse 13 is a continuation of verse 12 and personifies the word. Now we just looked at that scripture. The word of God is quick and powerful. So as uh, the Lord is powerful, so is the scripture. And uh, when we preach the word or teach the word, sometimes uh, men think that they must add uh, their power or their influence or their uh, knowledge to the word of God to make it accomplish uh, what it should. But the word is powerful enough on its own. It doesn't need me to make it powerful. And uh, we look then to Revelation chapter 19. Uh, Revelation 19. And there we find concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that he is powerful. Uh, we can look at verse 6 of Revelation 19. I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Mm. Omnipotent. He is all powerful. Mm. And uh, we look further in that same chapter to verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He's almighty. That word almighty in your King James Bible is always capitalized because it is talking about a person. It's talking about God. And when you see the word almighty, that's always who it's referencing and it cannot reference anyone else. Mm -hmm. No one else nor anything else is almighty. Amen. It is Amen. the Lord God. But you notice and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. What is that sharp sword? It is his word. When he returns, and that's a second advent context, when he returns to battle the armies of the world and to battle those devils as he makes his way down here, according to Isaiah 34, uh, he's going to just speak the word. And his word is the sword, and it's going to devour, and it's going to destroy. Why? It's all powerful. The words of the Lord are holy, um, for he is holy. We go back to the book of Revelation chapter 15, giving you some scripture this morning that just draws comparison between the person, the living word, and the written word. Here's something else unique about your King James Bible. And it should also be manifest in the writings of man, uh, in our own uh, writings and teachings but when you talk about the living word in scripture, it's talking about Jesus and the word word is used to describe him. 
it's always a capital W. And when you talk about the written word in Scripture, it's always lowercase w, to distinguish between the living word and the written word. And yet, the two are inseparable. In Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. For thou only art holy. And then back to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll read verse 16. The Bible says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. For I am holy. And the Lord tells us that indeed he is holy. And we look then to uh, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. And we'll read verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The holy scriptures. He is holy, therefore the scriptures must be holy. And uh, we're grateful that they are. And again, this is not talking about the original manuscripts. Certainly we know that he gave them and that they were holy, but they have uh, long since perished. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scriptures then, what Timothy knew from a child were the scriptures, but it wasn't the original manuscripts. It was copies. Mm -hmm. And just like this is. But this is still scripture, and it's still holy, and you probably have uh, maybe on the spine of your Bible or uh, somewhere on the inside, holy Bible. Mm -hmm. Holy Bible. It is holy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another way in which the modern versions lie. If they have holy printed on the front of them, uh, how can they be holy when they have uh, removed thousands of words, uh, left out entire verses on occasion, and changed uh, what it is that the scripture has to say. But you have a holy Bible. It's also pure. The first, in 1 first John chapter 3. 1 John 3, we read. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The Bible tells us that he is pure. And then the scripture that we've already used so many times in this meeting in Psalm 12. The twelfth Psalm, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. Well, we would expect his words to be pure if he is pure, and they are. The words of the Lord are pure words, the silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And uh, Psalm 119, Psalm 119, and uh, verse 140 Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. We do love it, and we love it because it is pure, and it is holy. Uh, we started in our text in the book of Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it, that men should fear before him. The word of God is effectual because he is effectual. Whatever he does, let's take salvation for instance. He's the one that saved your soul if you know him as Savior. And if you tried for a thousand years, you couldn't get a bit more saved than you are right now. Right. And if you tried for a thousand years, you couldn't get a bit less saved than you are right now. Amen. And why is that? Because whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. And then we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we read verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word of God. There, that lowercase w, you know it's talking about the scriptures, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, one of the modern buzzwords, you hear it on the news, you hear it in the classrooms, you hear it in conversations, the word impact. Oh, it's uh, the word of God has had an impact on us. No, it hasn't. Uh, in, an impact, remember, is something that happens on the outside. It, it, it's what happens if maybe you see... Uh, uh, Two deer butting heads or a car head-on collision, that's an impact. And an impact destroys things, messes up things. Right. Now, the Word of God is not impactful. The Word of God is effectual. Mm. It is effectual. And uh, to be effectual, it's something that is from the inside out. It effectually right. worketh also in you yeah. that believe. And it produces good results. It doesn't break things up. It put things, puts things back together. Mm -hmm. The word of God is effectual. Why? Because he is effectual. So, you know, the preservation of the scriptures and uh, think with me for just a moment on the infallibility of scripture. Mm -hmm. The infallibility of the scripture. Isaiah 55. The word of God is infallible. It cannot fail. It cannot fail, and it will never fail to do what it is God wants it to do. Now that's what Isaiah 55 verse 11 is telling us. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. It shall not return unto me void, the Lord says, because it is effectual. Psalm 119, back to that psalm again. Psalm 119 and verse 89, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. It's unable to fail. Yeah. It'll always be here. It'll always be in heaven. Man may try to uh, get rid of it, but they cannot. We look then to Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one. In Second Peter one and verse nineteen, the Bible says, "We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein too you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star." Now, that's Jesus. It's not like the NIV and other modern versions teach. It's not Satan. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time of the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, the word of God is infallible. It's a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? Well, the context is talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. When uh, Peter, James, and John were up there on the mount, whenever uh, the Lord uh, saw Moses and Elijah, and they did too, appear before them. And uh, then Peter, he thought we ought to build tabernacles. And he was right. Just wrong time. It's going to happen at the second advent. They're going to build tabernacles. The Lord is going to tabernacle among men. And uh, he just had the wrong timing. And so God said, this is my beloved son. God, a voice from heaven, spake. Now, God doesn't do that today. Mm -hmm. He does not speak to us audibly. We have his word. Mm -hmm. And the completed canon of scripture, this is how he speaks to us. So whenever you hear somebody said, God told me. You be very careful about what that person has to say. Yeah. Uh, you can say God told us all yeah. and read scripture, but God doesn't speak audibly, but he did then on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a blessing if God did speak to us audibly uh, it, it, to hear his voice. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. 
But the Bible says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You know what's more sure than the audible voice of God? It's the written word of God. More sure. That's what the scripture says. And uh, that's a reason why we know that it is infallible. God cannot fail. Neither will his words fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have uh, the impeccability of scripture. Now you remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is impeccable. Uh, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Uh, there was nothing about which you could look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, that's wrong, or he's wrong, or that's not good. Uh, the impeccability of Scripture is there because of the impeccability of uh, the living word. Remember, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 17 say that men have tried to, uh, to corrupt the Scriptures, but while they've been able to set forth modern versions, they haven't been able to corrupt uh, this King James Bible. And we understand that. The Bible tells us in Titus 1 verses 1 and 2 that God cannot lie. God cannot lie. And we look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The scripture tells us that the word of God is incorruptible. It's incorruptible. Therefore, we know that it is impeccable. There's no part of it that's wrong, no part of it that can be in error. And that's because God gave it incorruptible. Then we look at the immutability of Scripture, uh, that men have tried to change the Scriptures. We readily admit that they have been or ever will be successful in doing so. Uh, we will never have to admit because they will not be able to change God's word. You know what the scripture says there, Malachi 3 and verse 6, concerning the Lord, for I am the Lord God, I change not. The scripture says, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's in Hebrews 13 and uh, verse 8. And so we look at the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. His counsel. Don't bet his word again confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope? We have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the Bible says that he confirmed uh, by an oath the immutability of his counsel. And uh, what does immutability concern? Unchanging. That's what it means. Right. Uh, now, the world is eaten up with mutants, um, zombies, transformers. It's about anything that, anything that changes the world likes. Yeah. Why, as Christians, we like things to remain the same. Yeah, right. And uh, the Lord will never change, and his word will never change. Right. He confirmed that by two immutable things, and uh, those two immutable things are not in chapter 6, they're in chapter 7. And uh, there in uh, chapter 7 and uh, verse... 
15, and it is yet far more evident. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. An endless life. You see, uh, the Lord is eternal, and uh, he will live forever. It's an endless life. If it had an end, that would mean the Lord changes. Yeah. Doesn't have an end because he cannot change. So, two immutable things. The power of an endless life. You know why you can be saved for all eternity? Because he lives for all eternity. That's the reason why. Never, we don't have to be concerned about that. Look at verse 23 of Hebrews 7. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Amen. There's the second immutable thing that by two immutable things the power of an endless life and he hath an unchangeable priesthood the very definition your king james bible always defines itself the word immutable means unchangeable and right there it is in the text and we're grateful that he hath an unchangeable priesthood that means that you'll always find him faithful if you uh, go to him uh, when you're a child and you need help and you need strength and you need comfort uh, you'll find it. And you'll find those thing, same things when you're an adult and when you're facing death. Why? He had an unchangeable priesthood. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to change. Uh, but Brother Pelkey's not going to always be pastor of this church. Uh, if the church continues, and we pray that it does, and uh, he uh, ages, the Lord's going to call him home one day. And so uh, doesn't mean that the church has to change. Right. But there will be a change as far as who's a preacher. Mm -hmm. And when we think of men, they change. Sometimes for the good. Sometimes for worse. Right. But it's not that way with Jesus. He has an endless life and he hath an unchangeable priesthood. And therefore, we know that when he uses his word, he will use it the same way mm -hmm. tomorrow and the next day next year, as long as we live. The scriptures never change. Amen. They will be here for our children. And the question is, will our children embrace them as we have? Amen. And uh, the value that we place on the word of God yeah. is the way they will see the word of God. And so let us live in such a way that we acknowledge that he has given the scripture that he has preserved the scripture, that the scripture cannot fail, it's infallible, that the scripture is not lacking in any way, it's impeccable, and uh, that the scriptures will not change, they are immutable. Amen. Well, that was a blessing. Two, two things that really stuck out to me I mean a lot of things but two things in particular I, I, I think <clears throat> the reason this book is a more sure word of prophecy is uh, I could stand up here and speak to you and in five minutes we dismiss and no one remembers what I said right because when somebody speaks audibly we can forget that pretty easily but the fact that God has inspired these words promised to preserve them and we have them it's a more sure word because they are forever written. They will exist for eternity. So there we have the more sure word of prophecy. And then over in the uh, second Thessalonians, this has been, you said this at, at my brother's the other night, brother Jeff, and it has been, it just has hit me what you said about <clears throat> effectual versus impactful help if I look when I'm flipping the pages in my Bible. I might not blow past it. All right, here we are. In 2 Timothy, nope, 2 Thessalonians, sorry. Boy, oh boy. 2 and verse 13, I believe it was. It says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Uh, 
That wasn't it. Where was it? First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. I wrote Second Thessalonians. I was trying to write. And... <laughs> first Thessalonians 2, and it was verse 13. There we go. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The difference between the impact being the external and the effectual being the internal work that the word of God does. But do you see the qualification for it to be effectual in our lives? Mm. They received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. When we receive it as it is in truth, the word of God, then the word can effectually work in us. Why do we think that Satan is working so hard to cause doubt and cast doubt on this book being the word of God? Because he does not want it to be effectual in the lives of people. And if we don't trust and believe with all ourselves that this is in fact the very words of God, it might impact us temporarily and produce something on the outside but it will not be effectually working in us because we don't see it as the word of God. We don't trust it. We don't believe that it is. So that just really hit me. That, uh, that was a real blessing. I hadn't seen that in the past and really picked up on that difference between effectual and impactful and that really, really special. So, all right, well, we got oh, 15 minutes probably before people really start rolling in. And about 20 minutes till the morning service starts. So let's fellowship for a little bit and visit. And then uh, we'll have the morning service starting about 1030. So I'll go ahead and close this in a word of prayer and we'll, we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the lesson this morning. And just seeing the correlation, the connections between you and your word. God, uh, it is special to see, just to see you all through your word. And Father, it is so special to see that you've promised to keep it perfect, pure, holy, uh, uh, immutable. Lord, it is, it is incredible to see uh, both your promises to do that, uh, your statements that it is in fact those things, and Lord, and then also to be able to see the evidence that you have kept your promise. Father, I pray again that our faith in your word has been increased and will continually continue to be increased today. Father, we just ask you to bless all that is said and done. We thank you for, uh, for this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.